Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, m and Bank, The Wickoff Group, Chelsea Lighting, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Liumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Eric Feinstein, LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, New Banks, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orphanides, Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis, Red Apple Group, Marglin Weiner & Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Popular Community Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American and these friends. Herring! Herring! What is herring? I don't know what herring is, but there's a guy over here who just wrote a book called Russ and Daughters, Reflections and Recipes from the House that Herring Built. His name is Mark Russ Fetterman, and Mark Russ Fetterman is the third generation of Russ and Daughters. Thank God he has a daughter, Nikki, who's now running the fourth generation with her cousin Mark, and I'm really lucky to have Mark Russ Fetterman. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. So, you know, it's what, the 100th celebration next year of Russell Coming Davis? up, yes. 1914. However, I, just for correction, yes. my grandfather came over and started with a push cart on Hester Street We're selling going... herring in 1907, so no, no, I, we'll I, call I, it 100. Wait a sec. We're going to talk a little bit about the family. We're going to talk about Russ and Daughters, and then we're going to talk about how the guy who went to Alfred University became a lock slicer and kept the Russ and Daughters business alive, that it's able to go to the fourth generation. So tell me about uh, your, your great-grandfather. My grandfather. Your grandfather. My great-grandfather I didn't know. My hey. grandfather I knew. He was a typical Eastern European immigrant. Galiziani, right? A Galiziana, for those who don't know what that is. It's the, if you ask my grandfather where he was from, he would tell you the Austro-Hungarian Empire with a great deal of hoo-ha. But it turns out that he was correct. The province, the royal province of Galicia, was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire so, until so 1917. So when does Zeta come over here? Comes over in 1907. He's summoned and sponsored by his sister, who preceded him here. Who came over? And she's, 1904. She's right, here. But with the $25? $25 sponsorship fee. Right, which he pays back to her later a nickel at a time. Well, she sponsored him. $25. She was in the herring business. Now, the herring business roughly meant a couple of barrels of herring in a little stall area. How did people get into the herring business? I mean... You had a couple of barrels of herring, you were in business. Right, but how'd she end up... How'd your, his, how did she get into it? Yeah. She married a guy who was in it already. How he got in, I don't know. His name was Eben she married into the business, in effect. Again, the business was a couple of barrels of herring. And at some point so, in so their relationship... Yeah. So how does Joel Russ come over here? How old is Grandpa Russ? Grandpa Russ was 21 at this point. He was basically thrown out of his house in this little shtetl when he was nine because they couldn't afford to keep him there. They were, these were poor people. And he was sent out to be an apprentice, and he apprenticed first to a shoemaker someplace in Poland. And that didn't work out. And then he was apprenticed to a baker someplace in Germany. And he was in Germany at the time that his sister summoned him uh, to come over and pay his fee. 
And he and so he ends up with your uh, with his sister in the Lower East Side. He ends up living with her on the floor. Um, she had the stall. He had a push cart. They were in the herring world. Uh, and then in nineteen so nineteen oh seven and nineteen ten, and then he strikes out on his own. Oh, someplace in there he goes to a matchmaker and he's fixed up with a lady from another poor little state near his. They didn't know each other in the old country. Bella Spire from Scola on Stree in Galicia. They marry. It's an arranged marriage. And in 1910, he's made enough money to pay back his sister. Right. Pays back the $25 that he owed her. Makes but the high Brooklyn. Basically, as you told me, it was a nickel a herring that he paid A nickel back. a herring, three for ten. Right. Three herrings for ten cents. So he pays her off, and now he moves to Brooklyn? Moves to Brooklyn with his wife. They, he buys a little candy store, which was a walk down, you know, two steps down. And he runs that for about three or four years, sells that, and moves back. And he's had one child there, his first daughter, Hattie. Who, uh, who's going to be celebrating her 100th birthday. birthday in less than a month. Right, so Hattie. Hi, Aunt Hattie. Right. So, uh, so Aunt Hattie is born. Right. And they, now they move back to Lower East Side. He actually, uh, you know, I'm, I'm rem there are some things I, I should correct. They did have a son, firstborn, uh, who died in uh, the typhoid epidemic of 1910. So the living children, the first one is Hattie, and he had two other daughters there. We'll get to them in okay. a second. Okay, so it's 1910. He's back. Hattie's born in 1913. Uh, they're li they're, they have the, the candy store in Brooklyn, Myrtle Avenue. And uh, he sells that in 1914. He buys this little appetizing store, if they were even called that in those days, right. on Orchard Street. And this appetizing store is, he calls it, Russ is Cut Right. J. Russ, Russ Cut Rate Appetizer. And doesn't he have a, a guy who works with him? At that point, no. He buys this shop from an Isaac Berger. That's Isaac Berger. Uh, was famous or infamous for having a horse. Isaac Berger would deliver his smoked fish and herrings around the area with a horse and wagon, and the horse became famous because the horse could swim. And Isaac Berger would go for the summers and do his business out in the Rockaways, and at the end of the day, he would take a swim, and the horse, whose name is Chestnut, would also swim. And it turned out one day, he went swimming, the horse went swimming, and the horse kept going towards the old country or something. Everybody had to jump in the water and rescue the horse. They moved, went back into the city. The summer was over. Isaac Berger is on his horse and wagon with this horse. Suddenly the horse hears the sound of water and charges towards the water, which turned out to be the fountain in Seward Park. And in this charge turns over the wagon full of smoked fish, which is scattered all over the place. Grandpa Russ buys the shop from Isaac Berger, because it was called Berger's Appetizing. Um, he had a horse and wagon, and I'm willing to say that the horse and wagon Grandpa Russ had was the same chestnut, now, but nobody's around. Okay, to, but in 1914, it's not at the Houston Street location. No, no. It's on, it's on, it's Orchard, on Orchard Street. Street. It's yeah. on Orchard Street. So let's talk. Now, your mother is born in 19... My mother is... No, my mother is born in 1921. 21. Hattie is 1913. The next daughter is Ida, born in 1915. Uh, at that point, Grandpa and Grandma Russ and Hattie are living in the back of this tiny little appetizing store with the herring barrels in the back room. Uh, then the second daughter is born, and then they move across the street to a tenement, four-story, well, six stories. They were on the fourth floor, walk up, typical tenement. The bathroom is, is in the hallway. The bathtub is in the kitchen. Everybody's heard about these tenements before. Uh, and they're on Orchard Street, which is filled with push carts, because that's the way business was done. And this area was the most densely populated area in the world at that time. Forget about Calcutta now. That was it. More people per square foot than any place else. Now, when did they move back to Brooklyn? Well, the, the concept was always to leave the Lower East Side. People today tend to romanticize the Lower East Side. People tend to think of it as the mother country, the old country, because more Jews, no matter where they are in this country, have a connection to the Lower East Side than they do to Israel. 
Um, and so they romanticize it and, and they see it through a nostalgic uh, lens. But in fact, the Lower East Side was awful, always so awful. So he moved to Brooklyn. The concept was to get out of the Lower East Side. All the immigrants wanted to get out. So he would move to Brooklyn, move the family to Brooklyn, never told anybody where or when they were moving. He would just move them. If he had a couple of bucks, move them back. If he lost a couple of bucks, and that was basically what was happening until 1926, when he was able to buy a two-family two house, house you told in me. Flatbush, which was something. And he ensconced his family there, and everybody but, was but happy. But then he lost it, you told me, the depression. It, so that was 1926. In 1932, the crash was in 1929. In 1932, he had, it was a two-family house with two mortgages, and two bankers showed up at his doorstep. And said, give us the house. They said, the house oh, or the business, right? They gave him the choice. Mr. Russ, it's your house or your business. And so the family mantra is vinemmen parnusa, Yiddish for basically means where, from where do we take our living or how do we survive? So they had to survive. In the now, his choice was the business. Well, you know, whatever income he was getting was from the business. Even it was pennies from herring, pennies from heaven. This was pennies from herring. <laughs> I like my material. Okay, good, anyway. good material. So, so he gave up the house. Gave up the house. And everybody and, and was then, depressed. Okay, and then they moved back to the Lower East Side. To a terrible tenement, terrible. Now, when, Does everybody say when, terrible? when did they terrible. move to Houston Street? That's not clear, but we're fixing it around 1923. Moved it around the corner. He had an interest. Now, he had his little herring and smoke fish right, business. And it was another store next door that he didn't control, right? Well, so he's on Orchard Street, and, but he has another sideline business going, mushrooms. Dried Polish mushrooms, which were sold. They were cheap, but they were a staple. Mushrooms were used by the poor Jews in the Lower East Side and poor Eastern Europeans, not necessarily Jews, as a, as a flavoring for mushroom and barley soup, for sauces. It had this rich, deep, earthy taste and was sort of a meat substitute in terms of flavoring. So that was a staple. And he was in this business of dried uh, Polish mushrooms with a Lanzmann, somebody from this same town in Europe, a guy named Hegel and they were storing their mushrooms on Houston Street, around the corner. And he had a falling out with Hegel. He, ultimately, my grandfather had a falling out with everybody, but with Hegel, and Hegel your, your, left. Your, your grandfather, in certain aspects of the old Seinfeld, could have been known as the soup Nazi of the appetizing business. Yes. If you don't yeah. like it, you leave. But Forget. he said it in Yiddish, and basically he was saying, if the lady gave him a hard time, I don't like that, give me that. Lady, do me a favor, lose my address. Lose my address. Yes, he was okay. that way. So let's, let's, let's move on. We're in the 30s, um, and, and later, you know, the, the daughters get involved with the business, right? They had no choice. It's not like they chose to do this. Uh, first of all, the 1929 was the crash. Correct. Everything went downhill. Uh, Anne Hattie had to leave um, school. She didn't graduate high school. Right. Didn't Anne Hattie work uh, for I. Miller, the shoe store? No, no. I. Miller was the comp Better. And Hattie went to work for the Wild Fjord Brothers. Right, but she used to uh, she check would, with the shoes. Her job was to do the books. She'd gone to bookkeeping school for a brief period but of she time. She had a perfect shoe size. You she, me. besides doing the books, it turns out Anne Hattie had a perfect size 4B. So when they needed somebody to model, I guess that's a good size in shoes. I don't really know much. But they would call Aunt Hattie downstairs from upstairs. It's not your shoes, I can no. tell you that. And Aunt Hattie would model the four Bs. Occasionally, they would send her undercover to the competition, I. Miller on 42nd That's Street, great. so she should find out what they're selling. So the daughters get involved with the business. All of them are in the business. But not and by choice. Not by choice, because it was part of the responsibilities. And the son-in-laws get involved with the business. Correct. Now, your mother, one day... Come, the, this is how your dad got involved with the business. Someone says, I have a man, the Sheik of Brooklyn, right? Yeah, actually it was my grandmother who was not your warm and fuzzy grandmother. She was about five foot high and five foot wide, chain smoked Paul Malls, and, and could curse with the best tugboat cap. This was my grandmother, my father's mother. But she was a customer in the store. We come from Brooklyn to shop by Russ, you yeah. know, smoke fish. And waltzed in one day, although waltzing is not appropriate for her, but um, she said, okay, 
which one of the Russ girls is not married? Uh, my son is the Sheik of Brooklyn. My mother said, well, you know, I'm not married and I wouldn't mind meeting the Sheik of Brooklyn. And so that arrangement, it wasn't arranged marriage. They got together and they actually fell in love and it was a love match. So now we have three daughters and three son-in-laws son all working in the business. Right. The war breaks out. Right. Two, two, the two brothers, your father goes into the... My father is drafted. Is drafted. In. My uncles are not. And to this day, we I have, have no, no idea, idea how they got out of it. But God bless Maybe them. it was a, a trait of uh, herring, herring to I someone don't else. Think so. So now your, your father is in the military. Yes. And then later on in life, you know, a son is born. You know, your parents, right? Yeah. And so tell me about you. You grew up, now at this time, was it Brooklyn or was it the Rockaways? Well, no, I was born on Lower East Side on Ludlow Street, I, around I, the corner from right. the store. And by age up. four or five, my grandfather had made enough money. It was, it was uh, just following the war. And he had made money in the war. The war was actually good for those kinds of businesses. Right, they were basically it. under the table, black market, ration, now, canned goods. The, everybody had to work in the business. Right. So you, the, the daughters worked, the son-in-laws were in the business, the kids were in the business. Correct. That was part of the job, okay? You have to work there, the holidays, the, the help has to be off, we have to work. There, right. Okay? So you over here going to high school, right. and at this time you were in Far Rockaway High School, correct? Right. You, you're working at the store, like everyone. It was Even the before high school, from the time know, you're 13, I, I you're so working. It was a responsibility, and then you decide to go to Alfred University, which I had no idea how, why, but you told me it was a school teacher who said uh, to We you, had guidance counselors right, in those so days. They gave you three choices. Here, apply to these three schools. You get into one, you go. That's it. So you go to Alfred University, and for some unknown reason, you get involved with ROTC. Now, a person like me realized that ROTC was not right. Was the What's Army, wrong with me, Okay, right? the Army <laughs> Reserve was the right way. ROTC meant four years in the military. Yeah, yeah. I said five years in the reserves was better. Right. So you go to ROTC. What's wrong with me? And, uh, yeah. Abyss of Meshiga. But, okay, so what happens is you go into ROTC, you finish um, Alfred. Right. And then you decide you want to be a lawyer. Right. And as you said to me, you wanted to be a lawyer because it was the rule of Eastern European or whatever Jews, you're not going to be in this business, you're going to go into another business, you're going to be a physician, you're going to be an accountant, you're going to be a lawyer, Right. and you go to law school, correct? Right, that's the fantasy. The fantasy. Nobody wanted their kid in that kind of, the fish business. Right, and, and everybody was leaving the fish business. That's right. And, but they, they were working so hard, the, my parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents, they were working so hard so that my generation would not have to do this. You finish law school, and then you realize you have an obligation. You've got to go into the military, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, what happened was that the school I went to, Alfred University, was a land-grant school, which meant that ROTC was required for two years. So we had to do that. All the boys had to do that. The next two years was purely voluntary. And but there like we the don't uniform. know. You love I like the, the uni music, uh, the come uniform. On. It was I a way to meet girls. women. It was, it, was, right. it was a combination. You understand this stuff. Okay, the whole thing. Now, so, what happens is but when I do this and I've, I extend it to four years and I commit myself, nothing really is happening in the world, right? So this is like 62, 63, 64. And then it turns out immediately after I sign up to do the full four years and commit myself, Vietnam breaks out. So that when I'm graduating, they're going to give me the sheepskin, the BA degree in English literature. So and under there, I'm getting commissioned as a second lieutenant. So I'm not going right away to the military. Then, then you finish law school. You spend time in the military. Uh, most of the time, pretty good. A couple of months in Vietnam. We've got to fast forward over right. here. Okay. You come back. So you finish military. What happens? What's your first job? You're, in a, you're a lawyer. You're not a, a locksmith. No, no. I practice law. I do some time with legal aid. Then there's something called that just starts the office of the special prosecutor for Najari, the state. Right? Najari, and it came out of Serpico and it's uh, prosecuting, investigating, prosecuting corruption. Um, and then and now practice I, Bauman Gardner. And then I decide I have to make a living. I have two kids now, and so I go to a private law firm. I'm a litigator, uh, and so that takes us up to the end of '77. So it's 1977. How did you decide to go back into Herring? I don't know. I wish I could tell you was that. I'd tell you, was I don't it know. Was it epiphany? Okay. Was no, it, it never happened that way. I don't know. I suspect, and I wrote a book hoping that it would reveal itself. Why did you do this? 
um, I suspect I wasn't all that, I wasn't particularly happy being in a law firm in that environment. But when you law. went back to, law, to the store, when you went back to the store, did you feel the, the heritage? What, how, I mean, when I went back to the store, I felt right. When I went back to the store, whatever romantic notions I might have had about running that business were just left me immediately because then you're faced with the daily grind of opening the, rolling up the gates in the morning, getting the fish in, maybe going to the smokehouses before, making sure and hoping that the staff shows up, then hoping that the customers show up, lining up fish and countermen and customer a hundred times a day, and then closing. So there's no time to reflect. But now you know, you've got to run the business. Okay, but now you're not a, a, a lawyer. You're a retailer. You're a merchant. Right. You don't, nobody you're, wants you're to buy fish from okay. a lawyer anyhow. You know, the only thing that made you like a professional is you were wearing a white jacket like a physician That's right. with your name on it. That's it. Okay, it's a, the mock, you know, much, you know, over there. You know, the few, the, the, in the beginning, when the, when the little old ladies would give me a hard time, I thought I would let them know I don't have to do this. I'm a lawyer or whatever. And I made the mistake. It was like my first day of somebody who was really giving me a hard time about the way I cut it, where I got it, you know, the whole thing. She was used to dealing with my parents. She didn't know what I was they doing. They were nice right? people. Forget they the, the, the kids. So she's giving me a hard time, and I'm about, I've had enough of it. I'm trying to be nice. The customer is king. That's what the mantra in the Russ family. And, but I've had enough of this lady. And I look up to tell her, look, lady, I'm a lawyer, but there's the mistake. You never look up with a knife in your hand. I cut myself so badly. Too bad you're... I mean, the, 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 the scar is still here. At that point on, I knew being a lawyer was going to be of no help, gunished help, and nothing but, else. But what happened? Okay, now, you know, you're, you're at Russ and Daughters. Nobody in the family wants it. You're, you take over from your, you, you buy My the parents. business from your parents. Uh, and, and you're there. You're there six days a week at that time. That's you right. know, Full time, running a business, and the neighborhood is changing. The neighborhood is no longer, you know, it's edgy, the projects. The, uh, the neighborhood had changed, and it so was many still in free fall. Correct. When I'm coming in, the, the Lower East Side was awful, and guess what? It got worse. Now, but let's talk about your kids getting involved. When they were growing up, were they working in the store, too? Did yes. Did they follow the tradition of Papa? They didn't follow willingly. I did what the Russes do. You're old enough, you're 13 or whatever, you're going to come to the store and help out. It's just, it's important to know how hard it is to make a buck and to know why your parents come home grouchy but, but and had, tired. But you had a son who wanted to be a physician. I know. Okay, I, you had a I'm son. I'm the only Jewish father who's uh, upset uh, he wanted to be a doctor. Okay, he wanted to be a doctor. He became a, a, an oncologist, and you told me that you were upset that he didn't come into the business. I'm thinking Sturgeon, and he's thinking Surgeon. I, we were not, never on the same page. Right. I and, love him and, dearly. And, and then you have a daughter who says, I, I'm into arts, okay, right. who, who wants to study abroad. Right. Right. So I was uh, not happy. I got to the point where, you know, retail is hard. You're standing on your feet. It's hard. I would say, you know, they're, they don't want it. Uh, there's nobody else. So, you know, I'll sell it. And the business had been picking up, so I could get a pretty penny for it. But I was never comfortable with that notion of selling Russ and Daughters. It had always been in the hands of a Russ. And that's when my daughter sort of entered back onto the scene. Yeah, but wait, your daughter moved to San Francisco. Your daughter, right. you know, you, your daughter spent the year abroad. And it's right after 9-11. What happens? She had been working, you know, typically, I'm sure your, your uh, viewers know this. So the kid goes to school in the East. As soon as they graduate, they're moving to the West Coast. The kids on the West Coast are coming to the East Coast. My daughter went to Amherst College and graduated, told me, hey, Dad, I'm moving to San Francisco. Nikki, do you have a job? Do you have a place to live? No, I'm going to San Francisco. Okay. So she wound up with a place to live and got herself a job in the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco. And Nikki's a smart, smart kid from New York, and her father's a retailer on the Lower East Side. Nikki gets herself to be the assistant to the director of this museum. It takes her about a year and a half to figure they're not making her the director. So she's leaving, and she says, I'm coming back to New York, Dad, and I get very excited. Here is my ultimate fantasy. Uh, not only my exit plan, but the fantasy is being able to stand behind the counter with your daughter 
But, but, but Nikki wanted to move this business into a different thing. She didn't want just to, to cut locks, okay, and right. to have herring. Right. She wanted to take this business into the 21st century. That's right. Something that Papa didn't know what the internet was, what social media was. I, I, I mean, the I'm old, the, right? The, <laughs> so, the only what do you social, want from me? I'm the old. only social media was you would be kibitzing it. That's and, right. Okay, Mr. Social. Mr. Russ is over there. <laughs> right. In, in the place. So how do you decide, how does Nikki and her, her cousin, right, oh, Josh, uh, Josh. Josh, who was, wasn't even, lived somewhere else in the Midwest, right. okay, how does Nikki and, and Josh decide to buy the business from Papa? Well, um, it didn't happen as easily as that. But um, with two Nikki, minutes, we have to get it done. <laughs> Nikki came into the business, and I see her as the heir apparent, and that's a mistake. I'm introducing her to, here's my daughter, Nikki, and she's the heir apparent. Nikki didn't want to be my daughter. She didn't want to be anybody's daughter. She's in her 20s. So she took off. I mean, me putting my arm around her and anointing her was like an exit sign for her. She took off and spent years doing the walk about the world and trying on various professions and things to do. Uh, in the meantime, my nephew, who is a, uh, I don't even Scientist. know. You know, he's an Chemist. engineer with computer chips and silicon stuff. I have no idea what he was doing. Not only that, he was raised on what's known as an ashram. My sister in the 60s, my older sister, she raised her kids on an ashram. At any rate, he decides he wants to come back, and, and I say, okay, come back, but I have no hope of this working. He comes back, he's good. Nikki now has figured out after years, she wants back, they're both back. Now we have three Mr. Russes in the store. This doesn't work. Three Russes in this No, small store, doesn't work. I decide the only way for this to work is they're partners, and I'm out of here. I'll write a book. Okay, so how old is Nikki, and how old is... Now? Yes. Gee, that's a tough question. You know the age of your kids? Uh, I think Nikki's I do. 35. And your, your nephew? My nephew, I think, is 38. So you sold the business. So are I, you, I don't retain a piece of stock in that business. Are you allowed to come in? Part of the contract. I come in and eat whatever I want. Eat whatever you want. Whatever. Okay. So when did you decide to write this little book? When I decided I couldn't be in the same store with them, what else am I going to do? I was no longer Mr. Russ. I'll write. I'll, you know, I'll take the rest of my life writing a book. What else am I right. doing? And you know what's the good thing is that uh, Nick, Nikki and Josh are running a very successful business, and they've, they've really taken it. I mean, you can't get into Russ and Daughters. It's always there, and people can buy on the Internet, and it's a great item. I'm going to tell you something. If you repeat it, I'll have to kill you. Okay, I know. but They're doing it. They're doing running that business better than I ever did. Oh, never. I, Don't tell anybody. I can't tell you. Right. But I would like to say I've really enjoyed spending my time, even though you didn't bring me any locks, but thank you anyway. Thank you.